Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer Museum. I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Conversation with Haskell Wixler and Medea Benjamin. This year, 2014, is the 50th anniversary of many critical events in American history and internationally. 50 years ago, Nelson Mandela was just being sentenced to life in prison in South Africa. The Vietnam War was just beginning with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Three young American civil rights workers were murdered by members of the KKK in Mississippi, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed by President Lyndon Johnson. And also 50 years ago, in October 1964, Martin Luther King Jr. was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for combating racial inequality through nonviolence. But I think that most of us here will agree that we still have a long way to go to promote a world without war and hunger and prejudice and oppression. So we're very lucky tonight to have two people who have a combined tally of over, I think, 110 years of activism between them. Um, and it's really thrilling to have them both here tonight. Um, Haskell Wexler has been a multi, multifaceted hero of mine. He was a hero of mine long before I ever knew he was an activist, um, when I was an obsessed film fan, and I knew him through the incredible films that he shot, including One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, Blaze, Bound for Glory, Looking to Get Out. Um, the list goes on and on. There are millions of great films he shot. The Heat of the Night, Thomas Crown Affair, Other People's Money, American Graffiti. Um, and then I got to know him when I actually worked in the film industry. And Haskell was a tireless fighter for the rights of workers in the film industry. He was the head of the camera union, and I was a member of the camera union. And he's been fighting for workers' rights around the world for many, many years, not just in the film industry. And then when I started working here at the Hammer, I got to know Haskell Wexler as the activist who has, since the very beginning of his career, been speaking out for civil rights and human rights around the world. He's been making films. He's been an outspoken um, speaker on issues that he feels strongly about. And I have to say, it's incredibly brave, I think, especially maybe in the film industry to do that, where it's really an old boys network and there's probably a lot of peer pressure to keep your head down. But as you will see shortly, Haskell Wexler is a one of a kind and an incredible person and uh, does not keep his head down. So after 92 years, he's still speaking out. Um, now, when we invited Haskell to come and do this program, we said, hey, who would you really just love to be in conversation with? Who do you want to have as your counterpart? And he said, Medea Benjamin. So we're really excited that she agreed to come tonight, too. Medea Benjamin has been an advocate of so for social justice for over 30 years. She's co-founder of both Code Pink and the international human rights organization Global Exchange. In 2000, she was a Green Party candidate for the California Senate. In 2010, she received the Martin Luther King Jr. Prize for the from the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the 2012 Peace Prize by the US Peace Memorial. And just this year, she received the Gandhi Peace Prize. During the 90s, Medea focused her efforts on tackling the problem of unfair trade. She helped place the issue of sweatshops on the national agenda. She also pushed Starbucks and other companies to start carrying fair, fair trade coffee. Since 9-11, she's been working to promote a US foreign policy that would respect human rights and gain us allies instead of contributing to violence and undermining the US's national, international reputation. Medea has also been on the forefront of the anti-drone movement. She recently published Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control. She also organized the first ever international drone summit, drone summit and led delegations to Pakistan and Yemen to meet with drone strike victims, as well as family members of Guantanamo Bay prisoners. So they have a lot to talk about, their long history in activism. I could probably spend four, five, six hours just going into details of their bios. They've both done so much, and it's you wouldn't believe me anyway, really, if I told you everything. So um, I'm gonna let them speak for themselves. I'll just quickly say that following their conversation, they're going to take audience questions, and I'll be up here to repeat the questions. Um, and then we're gonna have an informal reception with tea and cookies in the courtyard so that everybody has a chance to mingle with each other and talk. And so now, without further ado, Please join me with a warm welcome for Haskell Wexler and Medea Benjamin. Well, I see a lot of uh, friends and relatives out there. <laughs> S 
So I'm, I'm not going to be my usual abrasive self. However, I do really want to thank um, uh, Hammer for inviting us because this is a conversation. And, um, I would <laughs> and the woman sitting here, if, if, if you uh, look her up on the, um, or on the computer, uh, that's me, uh, you'll see uh, what kind of a, a life she's living uh, for all of us, uh, an active uh, citizen uh, who takes what America should be about seriously. Uh, Medea, yeah. Now, um, <laughs> we were back there talking. I, would, I, I think we could spend a couple hours at least learning stuff from her. So she, she asked me, um, she said, well, Haskell, you should, um, you should say uh, why, you know, what, what got you started? Why, why are you on this soapbox? Well, wait, was, first, first let me say that he wanted to go right into the soapbox, <laughs> talking about what he read in the newspaper today and how angry it got him. And um, we said, slow down a little, Haskell. Let's ease into this, um, because it was a conversation that's a difficult one. It's the Israel-Palestine conversation. So we thought, let's give a little sense of how you got into using your brilliance. And let me just say, I mean, what an honor to be on the stage with Haskell Wex. <laughs> Never in my wildest dreams okay. would I have ever thought so, I would be on the stage with okay. you. But how did you use your absolute brilliance as a cinematographer and bring in the political side of it? And I think we want to start with that, right? Uh, OK. Um, I'm trying to. Th uh, I have. We, we listen, um, when I, I when I one the one of the reasons that I'm here and my is is also my visibility. Uh, if I were just uh, another hairy ass cameraman with an opinion, I wouldn't be here with a microphone. But I won an Academy Award. And, what the hell year it was, 67 or something like that. And so uh, I'm, I was certified by the system as someone worthy, okay? So I'll take it. Um, but um, I have a clip of when I accepted that award uh, that uh, might be uh, interesting. C could you play that clip of the um, uh, award speech at the Academy? At the Academy? Presenting the awards will be Dr. Shivago and the girl who popped the mercury out of his thermometer. Here are Anne Margaret and Omar Sharif. Well, welcome. Anne Margaret, is it true you were born in Sri Lanka? And Omar, you're from Egypt? Yes, and uh, you, I think, were born in England, right? Right. Is Everett Dirksen the only native left in show business? <laughs> All right, and Margaret, let's begin by reading out the names of the nominees for the best black and white cinematography. Joseph Lachelle for The Fortune Cookie. Ken Higgins for Georgie Girl. Marcel Pignon for Is Paris Burning? James Wong Howe for seconds. James Haskell Wong Wexler Howe was a young... Afraid of Virginia Woolf. To make a was a mentor to me. The winner is Haskell Wexler for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> I hope, I hope we can use our art for peace and for love. Thanks. 
Was that a beautiful acceptance speech? What more is there to say? Peace well, and love? You know, um, walking up there. Running. What, what, Running. Yeah. You ran. Walking up there. <laughs> you ran. Huh? You ran. Oh, yeah, ran. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, I went through my mind and I said, you know, I was thinking about thanking Mike Nichols and, and all, all the other people because we as directors of photography, it's, it's all the elements of what we do are part of it and I wanted to thank them. And then I said, damn it, Haskell, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to talk to a, a million people. It's, it's the only time in your life you'll be able to talk to that many people. Uh, and then, um, and then it came out, it uh, came out of me. And what came out of me, when you see it now, at least to some of you younger people, um, should know that they were revolutionary words. You know, <laughs> peace meant what the hell we were doing in Vietnam, you know? Well, we were, you know. Back like, in 67, this is, yeah. so. And, 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 and so, uh, and and that a lot of the objections to me making a political mark because at that time um, people didn't say things like that at the academy uh, were that um, that this is not the academy is not for political places and that that's an argument um, but it was but peace was a dangerous word to the system. And and love, love is 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 hippies. It's the other. It's the alternative generation with long hairs and 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 granola and girls with with uh, no bras and t-shirts. You know, sounds and, fun. And um, and that was um, and that was uh, the expression free love. In fact, one of the things were accusations against communism was that communists preach free love. I don't know whether you were alive enough to know that. So that, um, so that answer, somewhat answered what you were asking, Medea, is that is that was the, if you need a specific point of when I said what I want to do uh, what, with what I do, and that is tell pictures uh, tell stories with pictures. Um, so then did you, through your career, choose pictures that had political content, or did you just need to get work in the beginning, and then you worked your way up to where you could make those choices? Uh, you got me. <laughs> I mean, um, all of us have to make compromises with what we do with what we call our work. And uh, hopefully uh, we can do with our work something that's productive, that's human, that you get paid for, you know? And if you're, um, if you uh, are in uh, a way of expressing yourself through, f through filmmaking, uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to go that line uh, I made a lot of commercials, some of them very popular. Uh, I made all the Marlboro commercials, for example. And um, even um, and I visited some of the Marlboro men at the motion picture home with Emphasia. Emphasia had gone down to Texas a lot. And the advertising agency people that worked with us were good people. Uh, but I was partners with Conrad Hall. Um, but then we decided, no, we're not going to do, we're not going to make cigarette commercials. And so that was it. And then the um, advertising agency came to us a few weeks after we made that statement. And, um, and, they, and we knew them well. We knew their families. It was, you know, and they said, uh, well, we have some uh, commercials to do. And I said, well, Neil, we don't, we don't, we don't do them. And he says, "Well, this is for Europe, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay." Then it's okay. Yeah, and and, and the budget, 
was incredible. And so I said, well, um, no, we, uh, we just don't, you don't do it. Um, and he said, well, you're, well, we'll use, you can bring your crew. We're going to Chinchita in Italy, and then they can spend a week off in London on the way back. And so then I said something, that compromising statement that we living, that we all have to live in a, in a society where the priorities are not necessarily human, uh, but, um, but monetary. And then I said, well, maybe my partner will, uh, Conrad Hall. And then, um, so then he went into the room with my partner, Conrad Hall. <laughs> and um, and um, uh, so I was willing to, to split the pay, this, uh, I think it was $280,000, with Conrad to make the commercial. So I'm saying that in life, um, those of us who can make choices about what we do um, have to make them. And, and they will, we will make them if we're not kept from evaluating things, um, that, uh, if we're not deceived by, uh, all by the media and the popular ways of presenting ideas to us. Um, now, um, I, I sort of got long-winded on some personal thing, no, no, Medea. No. So, um, um, look, uh, Medea, let me ask you a question. No, okay. no, I don't think we're ready for that yet. <laughs> uh, no. I would think we're, we're still easing our way into this because we want to show, do you want to see a couple more clips? Because yeah. once we get into the conversation, we're going to forget about the clips. And I think um, you well, have okay. such an no, incredible... No. Huh? Uh, how many of you just love the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So Haskell set us up for this next clip because you know you gotta see that a clip from that if you have Haskell sitting here. Um, look at um, this is supposed to be a conversation. <laughs> and, and, but, but let me but let me I want to talk about him and he wants to talk about But let me tell me. you something. Uh, this this woman is one hell of a strong woman, and as my wife will tell you, I have difficulties because of my generational thing. I hope dealing with with them. So <laughs> even though, <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, I think I think that uh, this clip from um, from um, from Cuckoo's Nest. Um, brings up an issue which I think we both can discuss on, okay? Um, and it's, uh, it's brought up by um, a character in The Booby Hatch, <laughs> and um, who was hearing his uh, compa compatriots uh, talking about this and about that and not, and not dealing with, with really what's, what's going on and thinking. And uh, his name is Harding. If you play the, it's 52 seconds. It's a cuckoo's nest clip. Perhaps, but you see, the only thing I can really speculate on, Nurse Ratchet, is the very existence of my life, with or without my wife, in, in, in terms of the human relationships, the juxtaposition of one person to another, the form. Content. Well, they wanted to knock off the bullshit and get to the point. This is the point. This is the point, Tabor. It's not bullshit. I'm not just talking about my wife. I'm talking about my life. I can't seem to get that through to you. I'm not just talking about one person. I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about form. I'm talking about content. I'm talking about interrelationships. I'm talking about God, the devil, hell, heaven. Do you understand? Finally! <laughs> Tell him, Harding, Fucking god damn it. <laughs> I love that guy. Because, because knowing the connections and dealing with the connections will give us power, okay? So, and you chose that clip because you think it brings all of these connections together that 
you bring into your life's work? Uh, it calls to attention the fundamental thing we have to think about all these issues, and that is that we're on this planet, we're all human beings, we're all connected, um, and, and unless we um, unless we address that to all the conflicts and killings and, and emphasis on differences, um, uh, we're not answering the real question is why the hell are we here, okay? And that's why as it relates to our, to our art and to our being able to interrelate to other, uh, we have to be able to, um, to say, well, what's the really po real point of it? And one way is, you know, when they have family counselings and there's arguments and things of disputes and things, the counsellor always says, well, would you, what, what do you think this person said? And then they repeat it, and so they understand what they're talking about. And one of the things that the media does is it robs you with, with certain words, with certain shortcuts, so you don't listen to, um, to the facts or the issues. You only listen to the source and to your preconceived prejudices, and that won't solve anything. I think the other thing about that movie uh, is the whole idea of who is cuckoo and who is not, and are we living in this cuckoo's nest? And when so many events are happening now where, I don't know about you, but I oftentimes find myself living in what I think is in uh, a different world from what I see the media interpretation um, when I go to visit places, whether it's around the work we've done around drones with Pakistan and Yemen and hearing our government say, we're not killing any innocent people. And you say, what? Are they really saying that? Or when you see them in the case of drones again, going into court when they're being brought into uh, what is supposed to be a very sacred space in the court. And uh, the ACLU is saying, well, there's this 16-year-old American who was killed by a drone. Um, what do you, the government, have to say? And the government says, drones? What drones? And so you're really thinking, like, who is cuckoo here? Uh, and is this my government? And we certainly, many of us in this room asked ourselves that question a lot during eight years of the Bush administration but thought maybe we'd feel a little more represented uh, in the next administration, and yet on so many, particularly on foreign policy issues, I find myself in that same place of saying, this is not the reality that I know of. Uh, this is an, uh, a, a made-up fantasy that's being told to us by our government, that's being repeated in the media, and how do you break through those things? And I think, Haskell, you've done it so much through your work, through the incredible uh, documentaries, films that you have used to break through on everything from workers' rights issues to your work around the, uh, uh, when we were together in Chicago about the NATO protests most recently, to the Hollywood films that break through this. And I do it in a very different way because I don't have the skills you have, <laughs> which is to try to find the spaces where there is a lot of media attention and try to kind of pierce into that. And uh, it might be sometimes popping up to say something that nobody wants to have said or acknowledged, uh, but it's really the same kind of thing of piercing through and bringing reality into what is oftentimes uh, you, a you very did unreal that once. space. Uh, let me ask you, um, how's your shoulder? Uh, and, then, well, and, and, and did your arm cure? What Haskell's referring to is quite recently, actually in March, when uh, I was going with a group of 100 women from eight different countries around the world on a humanitarian mission to Gaza. 
This was before this la latest uh, outbreak of violence. And it was a purely humanitarian mission. Uh, we recognized that even then the people of Gaza were saying, help, we are under the siege and nobody's paying attention to us. And the only physical way that we could get there was to go through Egypt. Uh, Egypt, there had been a coup. And little did we know that that coup would make a huge difference in our ability to actually transverse the uh, Sinai and get into Gaza. And when I arrived in the airport by myself, because I was going to set up a lot of the logistics for the other women that were coming in, I gave my passport to the customs control, and uh, there was immediately red lights going off, and they said, come with me. Came with them, and hour after hour after hour, I kept saying, is there a problem? Can you tell me what the problem is? Uh, and no uh, response. And the uh, finally, I was taken into a detention area, um, uh, held overnight, and the next morning, while I had been using what is the beauty that we have right now of social media, imagine while I was being detained, I was able to tweet and <laughs> take pictures because the woman in the detention place with me, they hadn't taken away her phone. And it is quite amazing that you can get out to your friends around the world, help, I need help. They contacted the US Embassy and I kept waiting for my embassy to come and help me, waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, I got a message, the, the, the embassy uh, re representative would be there in 10 minutes. Well, this was 17 hours later. And in the meantime, a bunch of plainclothes thugs came into the detention space and said, uh, you're coming with us. And I said, no, 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 I, I want to just wait for my embassy, please, you know, give me 10 minutes. And that's when they threw me on the floor, st stomped on my back, uh, pulled my arms so uh, violently that my shoulder came out of its socket. And when I started screaming, they took the scarf from around my neck and stuffed it into my mouth and uh, dragged me to be deported to Turkey. Um, it was a, a, a horrible experience, as you can imagine. In fact, the Turkish uh, airlines did not want to take me because they saw what pain I was in. They said, we have to call an ambulance. Ambulance came. The doctor said, she's in no shape. She has to go to the hospital. And the uh, Egyptians threw me onto the plane anyway. Um, the, the point is to say that um, we have a lot of um, uh, governments now that the U.S. has been supporting, like this coup government in Egypt, um, that when you try to do something like just do a humanitarian delegation, um, you find yourself being beaten up, deported, and uh, in very scary situations. But I would say that um, in the work that I do as part of Code Pink, and I want to recognize both Jody Evans, the co-founder of Code Pink. Where is Jody? Up there. And Tig Barry up here in the front, my partner and uh, co-conspirator, um, that we um, find ourselves in many, many difficult situations, but we feel like it's important to keep putting ourselves out. Um, in our writing, in our work, and physically in our bodies, because that's what we have to do to pierce through the bubble. Yes, that's, um, see, that's part of what's happening. Uh, we, we are becoming um, a, a militarized nation. Um, when you mentioned the e Egyptian coup, where they had sort of a genuine type of people's resolution, revolution there. Uh, three and a half billion dollars, I mean, it was, no, it was one billion and three tenths of, of a billion went immediately to the, um, to the Egyptian military. And then the Egyptian military is there. Now that's all, that's all um, garbage or at least other stuff for most of us in America, because I think uh, I made a note that, that we sort of allow ourselves to be deceived by those who have a stake in pers persuading us to ignore reality. 
And that's where, um, when I talk about um, media, when I talk about, um, uh, where, where's my, my, my book uh, about, it's supposed to be about Snowden, but it's about, um, about surveillance on every aspect of everybody's life and the power that that exists. That that's where, uh, that's where a system can, um, uh, can and does uh, control, control you um, and can controls media. Um, yeah. Uh, I was going to bring up uh, that Haskell and uh, I were together not that long ago in Chicago when you did a film on the uh, NATO gathering that was happening there. And uh, maybe we could go to a clip of that that looks at the militarization that you are talking about. Could we go to that? That'd be good. The, 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 the film's called Four Days in Chicago, and this was just a clip. At McCormick Place, site of next week's NATO summit, this nation's largest convention center is becoming its most impregnable stronghold. Mayor 1% Emanuel has issued an invitation to NATO's warmongers to invade Chicago. The, the system is failing most of the people in some ways, and people are in the streets. NATO has got to come. Attention. This is the Chicago Police Department. You are engaging in unlawful conduct. If we were starting a new community, would this be why we create police? Holding in a democratic demonstration? This is a democracy. They answer to us. They answer to us. You will continue to play our full part in building a world that is safer and more secure. Um, you know that that for for two weeks, the 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 city of Chicago was basically closed down. Uh, schools were closed. Uh, I have shots of uh, LaSalle Street, the main business street, the Wall Street of Chicago, where usually workers are walking up and down the streets. They weren't there because Chicago was built with. Uh, on fear that the invaders, the occupied people, were coming and they were going to um, uh, break windows and do violence and make care. And, and actually, I went to shoot there because I had shot uh, Medium Cool in 1968, and in the Chicago and and and, and um, the Chicago Tribune uh, wrote an article uh, commenting on that and saying that um, Chicago will be uh, better prepared to deal with, um, with uh, people uh, in, in 1968 than they, than they were in 1968. So then I, when I went back to Chicago, um, uh, I went there with the idea to see uh, how they're going to do it. And, um, and how they did do it is they, they frightened a lot of people in, in the city, uh, including my friends who live in big apartment buildings, and they're really not afraid of what the Occupy people do, but they hired people that says security on their, on their shoulder to walk up and down in front of the building with a gun. So that um, it's part of um, how the system uh, keeps people in fear of the other. And um, and if they need, and if you're in fear of the other, and people who know the professionals, the 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 government, if they if they know um, who's out there and who who has bad thoughts about you, and they're willing to function uh, preemptively to to get them off, that that they will protect you, and so. Um, with that, it has a numbing effect on us to figure out what's going on and to participate in democracy. So, um, Well, I love that clip because I love the young soldiers saying, is this what we want our police force to be doing? 
And I see living in DC and then traveling around the country, the militarization of the police forces. And this is something that is so dangerous because it's part of the money-making machine that is the military-industrial complex. Uh, in fact, the uh, tanks and things that are no longer being sold to Afghanistan, those companies are now selling them to police departments. And you know right here in Los Angeles, uh, the police department wanting to use drones. Well, the drones, uh, the airspace is not yet opened up to drones because of safety and privacy issues not being worked out. But the industry is pushing harder and harder and harder and wants the Federal Aviation Administration to open that up. And there's 18,000 uh, police uh, stations in this country and the industry, the, the manufacturers want to sell them to every single one of those police stations. So uh, who is it that's being surveilled? Who is it that is getting the brunt of the militarization? It's communities of color. It's people who dissent. It's occupiers. It's uh, uh, anybody who feels, uh, who the 1% feels they need to be protected from. And that is not what our police forces should be about. Uh, that is not where our city's money should be going. And I think it's now exciting to be part of a movement that is trying to turn this around and to recognize that uh, we, are, uh, we have great allies with groups like the ACLU, uh, with groups on the left from the Occupy movement that hasn't disappeared but has only morphed into other kinds of things, uh, and with people on the right in the Tea Party that are concerned about uh, Big Brother and don't want to see government spying on them. So it is an interesting alliance now of sometimes strange bedfellows, uh, but happening around the country to try to rein in the police forces, to try to stop the militarization. Uh, but um, certainly I, I, I want to thank the people, in fact, who here in, in Los Angeles has been working on issues related to this here in your own city. Just a couple of hands up in the back, so it seems like you need more help here, I would say. Um, but it's something that um, is uh, dangerous and has to be fought against. Yes. You, you know what I was thinking? I was, I was listening, but I was also thinking. <laughs> is, that, is that here we are at the hammer. The, that organization was formed by Arm and Hammer. Uh, I was in Gorbachev's uh, still Soviet uh, Russia. Uh, I had done a film called uh, War Without Winners. And uh, there was uh, another film I did, Latino, what was being shown. And, and Armored Hammer uh, was there uh, because he wanted, um, he wanted to have the, believe in the arts having some interconnection to break the Cold War aspect of us poised with nuclear weapons to kill each other. And also, as reported, that he wanted to do some business um, in, um, in, in Russia. And uh, it was closed off because of the Cold War. But um, because of that connection, um, Arm and Hammer was on uh, J. Edgar Hoover's shit list, um, and um, and so that it's sort of ironic, or at least not ironic, but but a positive that we're in a place uh, uh, named I mean, and formed, begun by someone called Arm and Hammer, who um, um, who uh, allows. Uh, two other people who were on all the NSA lists, um, <laughs> uh, known if and if, if for not, I'm going to go complain. And, but I know for <laughs> I, I I know for myself um, since I was in high school <laughs> uh, that um, they've kept records on me from my freedom of information, and interesting also how they don't just keep track of you, but they try to control 
your career because visibility, and that's why I mentioned at the beginning about me winning these accords, is visibility gives you a mouth and, and or a camera or whatever, and that can break the, um, the wall of, um, of information that um, a, a, a society that doesn't want an active participation of the people. Um, well, I, I, I think it is beautiful that um, you have the example of Armin Hammer going to the Soviet Union at that point. Uh, and yes, he had his business interests, but uh, recognize that it was part of a political opening. And we have, at, as Code Pink, um, tried to push our government to be doing those political openings. And when they don't do it, we try to model it ourselves, which is what citizen diplomacy is all about. We have gone to uh, Afghanistan. We went, uh, the first trip, Jody, we went to Iraq, right, under Saddam Hussein, when we were trying to stop the invasion of Iraq. And going there as a group of women to say, we want to talk to the Iraqi government. And what is all this about weapons of mass destruction? We went and talked to the weapons inspectors. And they said, there are no weapons of mass destruction. Everybody here knows that. And um, uh, imagine the feeling of helplessness being in Iraq. And we, we were there when uh, Colin Powell gave his terrible speech before the United Nations. And when the Iraqi people knew right after that speech that the invasion was inevitable, and here we are trying to act as citizen diplomats, but feeling so helpless and hopeless because your government was bent on a war based on lies, and there was nothing that we could do to stop it. Um, those are terrible feelings uh, when you feel that you cannot influence your government. And after that, we've been going to Afghanistan, to Iran. Uh, we feel positive in some ways after these 12 years that the American people are not only war-weary, but are war-wise and have recognized all of the trillions of dollars that we have spent in these wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the drone wars. And what has come of that? Uh, what has come of that is a lot of death and destruction. The majority of the death on the part of the Iraqis, on the part of the Afghan people, but also, of course, death of our soldiers, injuries of our soldiers, and the, the depleting of our economy that will keep going for years and years to come. In fact, you know that we're still paying for the Vietnam War um, with the, uh, with the uh, Vietnam veterans whose health care we are paying for now. Um, so we will be paying for decades to come for these wars. But unfortunately, while the American people seem to be uh, tired of the wars and we managed to keep ourselves from getting directly involved in the war in Syria, so far we're on track with dialogue with Iran. Um, we still have a government, both in the White House and in Congress, um, that seem to be much more, have much more of an appetite for uh, military adventures overseas than the American public. She said, she looked at me and she said, right. It's so damn right. I, I, <laughs> um, uh, listen, there was one sort of um, residual thing um, from uh, four days in Chicago, which was posing this whole question of what, what are we doing with our resources, what are we doing with our, our thinking, with our orientation. Uh, but um, Criterion released uh, Medium Cool, and they released it with a, 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 a additional reel which compared um, medium cool time to uh, 2012, 2013 time where I shot four days in Chicago, and in that um, and in that um, disc that came up with Criterion was uh, this um, this clip uh, having to do uh, with uh, Monsanto.
Okay. Let me just then they done. Uh, now, um, there, there's, uh, for me, it was a couple of messages. Of course, by them blocking that off, uh, more people paid attention to a sign that I'd like them to be, so it, it sort of backfired. But the other thing is, I'm thinking that on a, an alternative reel uh, that dealt with a, a picture made in 1968, somebody at Paramount, some lawyer or some student, or I don't know who they looked at details of that and saw not the word fuck, uh, but the word Monsanto uh, as a delicate point. Um, and um, and uh, so they, um, they asked that Criterion uh, delete it from the, um, from the thing. So that's how I looked at the message. But obviously, you had the last word. <laughs> um, there, there was, a, there was a soldier uh, in Chicago, which you see, he was part of the clip here, whom um, I shot more stuff on him, and I think um, what he ex expressed in this clip. It may be too long for where we are now, but okay, play. Can you say what you hope the action of handing back your award so, um, so. and your medals means to you in simple terms? I am proud of what I did. When I joined the military, I'm proud of my intentions and I'm proud of my love for this country and wanting to change the world. I am proud of that. But what I did in reality on the ground, I am not proud of. And I, when I, as I throw back these medals on Sunday, I am saying that I reject, I return these to you, and I am no longer part of your system. I'm no longer part of your organization. I'm no longer part of your war. What would be, you think, a good role for the military? Like, what would you personally, in your experience, like to see the military doing? Well, I remember, I mean, I grew up with Rwanda. I grew up with images of Rwanda on television. I remember Somalia. I remember them dragging dead rangers through the streets. And that was a big reason of why I joined the Rangers. And for me, uh, serving in the military, my, my greatest goal out of that was to be in a position where I could stop something like that. That I could be the, the, the good person in between the food, the people, and the bad guys. It was very simple, but that's what I wanted to do. I think everybody can articulate, every soldier can articulate how difficult it is to serve and how many times they've been screwed over and lied to and taken advantage of and their contracts and their agreements have been broken. But to take it the extra step, to take it the step to challenge the entire decision to join the United States military, to go to a point where you're saying, my experience, the most important experience of my entire life, which it will be for everyone that was speaking today and every veteran that you ever meet, it will be the most important experience they've ever had. To say that experience is wrong, is one of the most difficult things. And it's and it doesn't, that's not what it means. What we're saying is we take accountability for our actions and our choices. We made the best choice we could with the information we had at the time. And we want to make sure the next generation has better options and better information to make better choices. Can I, can I pick up on that, Haskell? I think, I think why I wanted that is because like it was actually in the Vietnam War and all the time, is that it takes those people who question authority. Remember, there was a bumper sticker that, that said, question authority, that takes, makes them less than patriotic, less than America, separate. There was and, also and, the bumper and, sticker, don't trust anyone over 30. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And, and, and But what Kupner is saying is that he believes in America. He believes in, in what he stands for and what he's for, and that, um, um, and, that um, and that makes him more patriotic and not less. And I feel about the work that you do uh, should, be, uh, should be put that way. And I think that the people who are here, um, 
who will engage in some kind of discussion uh, afterwards that, um, that, that, that that will open things up. Can, can I uh, take off on one word he said that is so important, which is accountability. Accountability. Yeah, yeah. We do not have accountability. We get dragged into a war on the basis of lies. Millions of Iraqis die, and there's no accountability. We have a war in Afghanistan. They're writing books. That is they're making releases. They're, they're, they're still lined up with presidents. Yeah. So accountability is key, and I'm so glad you mentioned that. Well, one of, uh, we as Code Pink are one of the few groups uh, uh, that really believe in accountability to the extent that whenever Donald Rumsfeld, Condi Rice, George Bush, um, Dick Cheney are out giving one of their talks, we try, to, Wolfowitz, we try to be there. And we're not silent when we're there. Because we truly believe that you can have a democracy without accountability. And uh, Haskell, in the, in the green room, you said something, well, you know, sometimes people will think you look like fools. And I said, of course they do. Uh, and we know that, and that's unfortunate. And we don't really want to look like fools. But you know what? Sometimes the fools are the prophetic voice that you have to have out there. And um, we will keep doing it until there is some accountability. So maybe we should play the clip. And this clip is um, one example of us getting up and maybe acting like fools, but doing it from the heart. Because we believe so strongly that democracy has to be something that the people really fight for, or else we will lose it. This is a talk that um, was facilitated by your former Congresswoman Jane Harmon in one of the more liberal think tanks in Washington, D.C., because most of them are really just voices of the Pentagon. Uh, and this was a time when John Brennan, uh, who was the chief of counterinsurgency and in charge of the drone program, was for the first time talking openly about the fact that a drone program even existed. More broadly, al-Qaeda's killing of innocents, mostly Muslim men, women, and children, has badly tarnished its image and appeal in the eyes of Muslims around the world. Excuse me, will you speak out about the even been innocents by the United States? What about the hundreds of innocent people we are killing with our drone strikes in Pakistan yeah. and in Yemen and Somalia? I speak out on behalf of those innocent victims. They deserve an apology from you, Mr. Brennan. Ma'am. Well, how many people are you willing to sacrifice? Why are you lying to the American people and not saying how many innocents have been killed? I Thank you, ma'am, for expressing your views. There will be time for questions and answers after the presentation. In, in uh, uh, Pakistan, who is killed because he wanted to document the drone strikes. I speak out on behalf of Abdul Rahman Al Awaki, 16 year old, born in Denver, killed in Yemen just because his father was someone we don't like. I speak out on behalf of the Constitution, on behalf of the rule of law. I love the rule of law. I love my country. You're the So uh, it's unfortunate that we have to do that kind of thing, isn't it? I mean, it's unfortunate that our government lies to us. It's unfortunate that our media uh, regurgitates those lies. And it's unfortunate that there are so many things that our government does that we don't even know about. I mean, our government has killed a 16-year-old American boy and has never been held accountable for it. Our government has killed thousands of people with drones and has never been held accountable for it. And this is under Barack Obama. We're not talking about George Bush right now. So this issue of accountability is so absolutely critical if we're going to hold our head up, heads up high and say that we live in a democracy. You said it. Um, you know, uh, Orwell said that if you... Those who control the past control 
the present. Those who control the present control the future. And unless we're able to examine the past, and of course, with our history now, past is like three or four weeks or so go off the new, then, if we, uh, then uh, we, will be, we will remain victims. But I know with um, people like you out there, and you're not alone, you just know how to get out there, and that's important, uh, we will. Well, I think before we open up to the, the uh, um, questions, maybe we should allow um, Haskell to go to where he wanted to start out, which is around Gaza. You wanted to start this tonight talking about what you read in the paper, what you saw. Uh, uh. Listen, I don't know whether, um, I was just thinking about today. Um, today, I looked at, um, C-SPAN, on, um, on the treadmill, I have to have a video. So I had a C-SPAN um, that um, has uh, the, the 92 spe special. 92 on a treadmill. Think about yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, has, it, has, it has a special um, meeting about, um, about the war on Gaza. And, um, um, and each nation in the world uh, talked about what it is. It's, it's genocide. It is, it is women and children are being killed. And, um, and, and so, um, and yet, um, how it's been reported, I also got the Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal talking about him, um, says uh, news, it says that, um, it says, Hamas forces Ga Gazans to act as human shields, deliberately causing Palestinian civilians' death to provoke international pressures on Israel. Uh, they say that Hamas hijacks UN facilities in Gaza for terrorism. Uh, UN forces discovered Hamas, Hamas rockets hidden in three UN schools. Now, nowhere is anybody saying anything about the children, the people. And that's what, um, um, uh, that's, that's what's missing. I, I, um, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to say that the whole, uh, what's, I'm just wondering what has happened to America? Because you listen to the speakers that were allowed three minutes from all the nations in the world. We're speaking of, of what's, what's happening there on, on human terms. And, um, You're talking about a UN session. And, and, I, I, and, 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 and what is the definition of the word genocide? It says, the deliberate killing of large groups of people, especially those of particular ethnic group or nation. Okay? Uh, that's what you see here. And uh, there is what's happened to our conscience. It's been nulled and diverted um, by, um, by what Orwell was talking about. So I, I wonder, in this room, there's probably differences of opinion on this issue. And uh, I, I think you're Jewish, Haskell, right? Yeah. And I am as well. Uh, it was a very heated conversation always in my family. Um, <clears throat> but I think uh, that what Haskell is talking about is to reach down into the humanity of it all. And how can we sit by and as over 1,800 people just got killed in less than a month, over 400 of them children, and say this is self-defense. There has to come a point, and I think a particular right responsibility for those of us in the Jewish community, um, to speak out on behalf of innocent people, on behalf of children. And that's why I've gone to Gaza, how many times have we been, Ty? Eight times. Uh, and always go and say that I'm Jewish. 
Um, and and uh, I, I had an article uh, I put out yesterday talking about the need to take Hamas off the terrorist list and sit down and talk to them. Because you don't make peace with your friends, you make peace with your enemies. You've got to be at the table with them. You've got to convince them that there's something in it for them. And what has to be in it for them is a relief of the siege of Gaza that has kept 1.8 million people in the largest open air prison. So I think we're ready to open up to discussion right now, but I think you can see from both the history that Haskell has put forward from his work and my own work uh, that we really agree in the fundamentals, that we believe that uh, people and the planet are at the center of what our life's activities should be about. Uh, compassion and kindness are at the center. Um, keeping a planet for future generations is at the center. Uh, and not corporate power or a military industrial complex that has a, uh, a, a wh wheels churning of its own. So thank you for listening to the first part of the conversation and let's open it up to your own uh, issues and questions and, and comments. Could you could you explain in more detail your um, your objections to Monsanto and um, explain why you think that protest that protester was there in a larger protest against NATO? Can you oh. explain your views on Monsanto? And explain why you think that protester was was there in that protest in Chicago, uh, in a larger protest against NATO. So um, what did the issue of Monsanto have to do with the NATO protest? Why is this part of a larger? It, it had to do. It had to do with with uh, media. It had to do how um, how the uh, safeguards of the system as concerned of what information comes out into the public. I, I think the issue is more about how. Uh, why would a protester come out to a protest on NATO with a Monsanto sign? How does the issue of corporate power around Monsanto feed into the larger NATO protest? In other words, you're asking why, why it was in the um, demonstration against uh, NATO by Occupy. Yeah. And then... So I can answer that because I was there as well, if you, if you don't mind, which is that uh, I think um, the people who came out around NATO, NATO is not uh, well understood in the United States. It's not a big issue on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. It's much more understood in Europe. But the issue was that people who run uh, institutions, military institutions, government institutions from around the world were coming together in Chicago. And this was a time for the 99% to come out and say, what are the issues that we really care about? We really care about a healthy food system where we don't have to worry if we're getting GMO foods fed to us when we want uh, when we want organic foods. Uh, we want labeling on our products so that we know what it is we're eating. And we don't think it's right that corporations pour millions of dollars to stop us from getting that labeling. Um, those are examples of the kinds of things that the people who came out were interested in. And I thought it was great to see in the NATO protests that it went from everything about militarization and US troops in places like Afghanistan or, and Iraq to issues about uh, the kind of uh, water systems, clean systems that we want, the way we want to use our money, uh, the healthcare system that we want, the, uh, uh, the education system that we want, and uh, the food system. And in fact, one of those protests went right to the home of Rahm Emanuel and 
thousands of us sat down in the street in front of the mayor's house, and one by one, people who wanted to speak on an open mic got up and talked about what they didn't like around the way the city was being run. And many, many issues came up there, and what was beautiful about it is that we all understood that these were intertwined issues, and that the issue of corporate power is at the center of many of the concerns we have about our, the way our countries and our cities are being run. Also, many people don't know, but Monsanto got its start making Agent Orange. That's, right. That's where they then developed Roundup, which is the uh, crop. Yeah, so let's That's take another question. Hi, uh, just uh, an observation about the president's comment on um, Israel defending itself. Can we first yeah. give a hand to Blaise von Payne, who's <laughs> It seemed revealing <laughs> hi, of a long policy of ours as we were just defending ourselves from the Vietnamese children. Yeah, we were just defending ourselves from the Salvadoran children, the Nicaraguan children, the Guatemalan children, the, the children of Panama, the, the children of Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, should I go on? Yeah, the point is, we as the aggressor have identified ourselves as having a right to defend ourselves, and we don't have that right. The aggressor, an aggressive war, is the greatest international crime containing within itself all other crimes. That has to be dealt with, and I think it's very essential that we not allow this to continue without punishing those who are responsible or this will be repeated. Thank you. You might have also heard a comment that the president made uh, saying we tortured some folks. Did you hear about that? And then he went on to say, but they were working under very stressful conditions and they were really patriots. So the torturers are the patriots. And talking about accountability, um, we are still waiting to see the torture report that was 6,300 pages that the Senate Intelligence Committee has been working on for years now. But unfortunately, the president allowed the CIA to redact it. And uh, in one of the very few things I want to commend Senator Feinstein for, because uh, she has been a great supporter of the um, NSA and spying until she found out it was happening to her and her committee, <laughs> and suddenly she cared about it, uh, but now she is doing a good job to try to get some of those uh, redacted parts of the torture report put, put back in. But unfortunately, we will never get to see the whole 6,300 pages. We will only see a small portion of it. And remember, when we're talking about we tortured some folks, we tortured some folks so much that we killed them. We tortured them to death. And that should be something that the American people should have a chance to see, and the people who do, did it should not be called patriots, they should be in prison. Haskell and Medea. Um, Haskell, when you were reading from the Wall Street Journal uh, some of those alleged facts, um, the question I want to pose, and I, I want to preface it by saying I had a conversation um, at the uh, drugstore that I go to uh, with a, a young Jewish man um, talking about the Gaza situation. And um, the way the conversation started was he said, how are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm pretty good. I said, how are you doing? And he said, well... I'm okay considering that the world is falling apart. And I said, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. And I said, you're talking about Gaza and Israel? He said, yeah. And, and uh, he said, but thank God for the Iron Dome and thank God you know, that all this money is being, we, we really need it, Israel needs protection. 
And I said, well, you know, I said, I guess that depends on where you get, you know, your facts, you know. Um, and, and the thing, the question I want to ask is about the alleged facts. It's the media. How, how do we combat that kind of thing? You know, we're talking about, you know, trying to do the right thing, humanitarian and compassion, and yet, um, I get I get most of my news from KPFK. That's I listen to it obsessively, probably. But the mainstream media, it's a whole other slant, and that's where Americans are getting their information. And I guess my question is, how how do we counteract that? You know, how do you get through to people to get the real, you know, or certainly a different set of facts to them? So it's how do you counter the mainstream media interpretation of what's happening in Gaza? Well, first, uh, you've, you've been in Gaza, or you, you know what it is. Uh, they're able to get away with perpetuating um, Israel lies because um, we don't know any better, you know? We don't, the rest of the world does. If you heard that UN broadcast, all the nations in the world were looking at the situation, uh, the Israel vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, and they know, but we don't know. Um, but is, how, how would you, if those who say that it's defensive, they have rockets, uh, uh, Israelis have, or <laughs> have um, uh, planes and you know, tanks and all that stuff. But um, how would you say uh, it's retaliation? It's, uh, they, they believe the state of Israel uh, shouldn't uh, exist. Well, I, I think on this issue of the media, uh, it's been really interesting to see how um, the media is portraying this. I, I have wondered throughout this last month why Israel actually let uh, many uh, uh, important media outlets have their correspondence in Gaza because we did get to see a lot of the destruction. Sure, Netanyahu got a lot more airtime than any representative of the other side, but we saw the other side this time around like we did not see in Operation Cast Lead in 2008, 2009, or in 2012. And because we saw the pictures of destruction, we saw, because we saw uh, a lot of horrible scenes on mainstream TV, the poll showed that the majority of the public were saying that Israel had gone too far. And uh, that affected, finally, Obama saying, OK, enough, when about the eighth uh, UN school had been bombed. Uh, and then there's also social media. And social media is very self-selective. But uh, through Twitter and through Facebook, we were getting a lot of firsthand accounts from people inside Gaza. And so people who wanted to seek out the truth had a way to get that. So with uh, another interesting thing I found is that while the pro-Netanyahu um, uh, forces in the United States are very, very well organized, and any time there was a Hamas spokesperson or a, a, a Gazan ordinary person on the media, um, they would come back and, and start slamming the, uh, the, the media and say, you're being biased, you're telling too much of the Palestinian side. But the, um, uh, the, the people that wanted to get the other side were also telling the media, we want to hear the other side. So there was more balance this time around than we've had in the past. There are studies being done right now that show that there was about three times more pro-Israeli government side uh, represented than Palestinian, but even with that, that's something we hadn't heard before, and I think it really has changed the picture here. And I think we will see um, the Obama administration uh, doing things that it wouldn't have done in the past, which is standing up a little bit to AIPAC. And it hasn't done that before. 
So a lot of this depends how much we keep the pressure on. Uh, and one area where we really are just in a pathetic state is with Congress. Absolutely horrendous. Way worse than the administration. And uh, that reflects money. The two years, every two years that they're going around dialing for dollars and they don't want to upset their donors or their potential donors. And so I hope you all understand that while the uh, rockets were raining down and killing so many innocent people in Gaza, our Congress was busy voting time and time again, supporting Israel's right defense, blaming everything on Hamas, and not a word of compassion towards the innocent people who were being killed. And in fact, the, the first Senate vote that happened, there wasn't even a call for a ceasefire in that Senate vote. It was purely saying, Israel has the right to do this, giving the green light. And so whether it's Dianne Feinstein or Senator Boxer, uh, the great liberals, uh, or your uh, Congress people here, they really need to hear from us about how horrendous they have been in the last uh, four weeks, and that we want to see them come out saying that they believe that the only way to get peace in Gaza is to lift the siege. When in regard to the media, I think that we have to really support Al Jazeera, KPFK, and any place where we will get the truth. And they give it to us through so many of the programs. And if you listen and take that down and go right to your computer and start sending those messages out to as many people as you can, we will get the truth out because until the truth comes out, uh, people go on being ignorant, and they don't seem to know they have the responsibility to educate themselves. So do support Al Jazeera and KPFK. Full disclosure, I know some of the people on KPFK programmers, but I think that it's much more important than that because that's where you will get the truth and you'll be able to act. Joe Hill said, don't mourn, organize. Hi, Medea. Um, I read your article, and the part that you said about how there's people in Hamas who are way less radicalized and they want to negotiate and they want to find a peaceful solution. And I'm, that was the most hopeful thing that I've ever read about this whole conflict. And I just wanted to know what, like, what kind of a roadmap do you see that could happen that could ever bring peace there? And... Do those people that you know who are wanting to negotiate as part of Hamas, do they have enough control of things that they could actually deliver on anything? Well, what um, you're referring to, for those who don't know, is I talked in the article about how on one of our trips to Gaza, um, some of the Hamas government people asked to meet with a couple of members of our delegation, three of us. Uh, two of us were Jewish and very open about the fact that they were Jewish, and I think that's one of the reasons they wanted to meet with us. And they were very quick. There were about 12 of them. They represented different government agencies. Very quick to say how they have no problem with, with Jews and the Jewish religion. In fact, they were going on about the halal meat and how similarities and all of this. And they said, our problem is with occupation, and our problem is with repression, that we're under siege. And so we had a long, long, long talk. And uh, I realized, you know, they said that they are trying to stop the more militant members of Hamas who think that the only way to get any kind of concessions from Israel is through military action. So just like any organization, there are more liberal folks who want to use a nonviolent route, and there are more radical folks who believe that military action is the answer. Well, what do you do if you're trying to, to find a solution? You strengthen the folks who want a dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, what has happened through these last four weeks is that it has strengthened the military wing of Hamas. 
And whether or not we see it this way, in Palestine, even among those people who do not like Hamas, do not like the way they have ruled, do not like their ideology, they are, have supported them in these last four weeks. And so I think we're in a worse position now because of that. So what do we have to do? We have to go, we have to really take the, the negotiations seriously, which as I said in the article, and it's something that Jimmy Carter just came out with as well, saying take Hamas off the terrorist list. Give, strengthen the more moderate elements in Hamas, bring them to the negotiating table, and bring in the international peace, the international community to monitor the border. So yes, get rid of those tunnels and have things go back and, and in and out of Gaza, but have them watched by the international community so you know what's going in and you know where it's going to. And actually, the people in Hamas who are part of the negotiating team are calling for that right now. Do you think they want to live their life through tunnels? Nobody wants to, to live like that. So I think there is hopefulness uh, if the international community doesn't lose attention, keeps the attention on Gaza, and really works to come up with creative ways to open the border with Egypt, open the border with Israel, give uh, Gaza its own seaport, give Gaza its own airport, and have international peacekeepers there. Cut the funding to the um, said cut we, the funding to the Israeli military. I want to remind everyone that we're going to have uh, cookies and tea and coffee out in the lobby where you can continue this conversation with Medea and Haskell. Um, Haskell and Medea, would you like to make any final comments before we wrap up on stage and move outside? I'm 92 years old, but I'm, but I'm, not, I'm not ready to make any final comments. <laughs> Uh, 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 yeah. Thank goodness. Uh, I do want to say that, it, that it's time we look at the world as human beings. We look at the whole thing that Harding was talking about in the cuckoo's nest. We have to say, why are we here? Who are we? who there are, are, what people are worth killing, what people are worth uh, paying them less than a willing age, living wage, uh, what uh, dividing up, um, uh, dividing up and making uh, a, a world that works on, on, on greed, on business, on power, on military. And that has to start in the schools, that has to start in, in our attitudes toward sports, toward so many other things. The whole idea, I've just mentioned sports, but, but, but uh, sportsmanship uh, used to talk about team play and, and, and respect for other, and no, winning becomes everything. Having becomes everything. Possessing has him. Winning becomes everything. No matter winning what, it's, it only depends on for whom. And uh, that's not the way it is, you know? And as far as, as far as killing in general, I remember the film um, um, that Sean Penn was in, uh, Dead Man's Walking. Thanks, Rita, that's my wife. <laughs> uh, uh, that that he, he committed a crime and he, was, and, and he was going to be executed. And they asked him, what did you, what did you learn from that? And he said, well, I learned that killing is bad if, if I do it, y'all do it, or if the government does it. And uh, bottom line, uh, that's what we all have to learn, okay? Thanks. Well, I'm 62 years old, and I wish, I only wish, that I had the grace, the wisdom, the articulateness, uh, the memory, uh, and the beauty of this man sitting next to me. So can we stand up and just all give him a, a hug? <laughs> Much love and what an inspiration. Thank you.